that what it looks like, you know, any founder that wants to launch a business has an idea and they, they just plug into Cupchase and then they can just focus on building a product and shipping the product. The, the most important single piece of advice I would give myself, like, hey, think about who you want on board way ahead of when you need them. Hello everyone and welcome to the Dealmaker Show. So super excited about the guest that we have today is uh, someone as well from Spain, just like myself, also from Madrid, believe it or not. So super, super excited what he's doing. Uh, incredible journey, building, scaling, financing, you name it. Uh, and I guess that we're going to be learning quite a bit today. So without further ado, let's welcome our guest today, Miguel Fernandez. Welcome to the show. Hey, Alejandro, thank you so much for having me here. I'm super excited to be uh, sharing our story with you and, and to be talking to a fellow Spaniard, also from Madrid. Absolutely, so absolutely. Well, lovely to have you. So, so Miguel, I would love to, to start here with doing like a walk through memory lane uh, and obviously born and raised in Spain. I mean, how, how was life growing up in Madrid? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, life growing up in Madrid was fine. was a, a lot of fun. I remember like, I, I really liked growing things from the beginning, which I think is probably has influenced my whole life but I remember like growing up I spent most of my time um, playing Lego and building stuff I never got into coding as a kid which is, is sad and another usual entrepreneur story but yeah building things mostly Lego sets and then I yeah very curious about how things work so I studied engineering in Madrid I did mechanical engineering and then I went over to Munich where I lived for a couple of years where I did energy engineering with a focus on nuclear and then never worked as an engineer sadly um, I worked in consulting for a couple of years, doing banking and TNT. Banking mostly focused on fintech, which uh, is when I first um, got interested into the space. Back in 2015, this is now memory lane for sure, um, I think all the rates in fintech was around B2B, SMB lending, and then also robot advisors, which I think are remarkably not hot these days. Uh, but anyways, that's when I, when I fell in love with the space. Um, I tried launching two companies while I was in consulting. And of course, we did all the mistakes that people usually do, you know, uh, working part time and, and like, um, wanting to do our idea without violating with the market and so on. So both, of course, failed, but we learned a lot along the way. And then I really decided that I wanted to build things. So I joined, I left consulting. I joined a pre-revenue SaaS company in Spain um, as the nine, ninth employee, roughly, I think. And I was the first person in sales. And it was funny because when I joined the position, I joined as a business development associate. And based on you know all the interviews, job descriptions, and so on, I thought I was going to be joining to this strategy. Uh, and then when I got there, they just gave me a phone the first day and said, like, hey, so you're going to call, call people and sell the product. And I was like... Dial and smile. <laughs> Dial and smile. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I, I was, like, obviously not happy. I mean, I was very... <laughs> You know, I'm comfortable at calling people, but it worked. I ended up leading the sales and customer success teams relatively quickly right. and ran the company very fast. And then I eventually moved to, to the UK, to London, to open up the local office, build a team, enter the market from scratch. So it was quite a ride. And in those three years, as we went from you know zero to a few million in ARR, we really got to know the SaaS space and the SaaS dynamics and how SaaS companies grow, what are the growing pains, you know, around fundraising, cash management, revenue reporting, and so on that we're trying to solve right now. And then, yeah, left that company, came to do my MBA at, at HBS, and spent the first few months researching a lot around working capital and cash conversion cycle for different verticals, all with the idea of helping companies with a working cap and their, and their funding needs, uh, basically helping them to either pay later or get paid earlier so they will have more cash in hand to grow. And we looked at different solutions for different verticals. We looked at factoring, we looked at supply chain finance, we looked at trade finance, and we really felt that we didn't really add anything to what was in the space currently. So we just kept iterating and iterating. But the more we learned about the topic, um, the more we honed in the idea. And then eventually that topic of helping companies to get paid earlier clicked together with the pains that we felt operating a SaaS business. And we started with Capchase. Uh, early 2020 and since then it's been a ride right we spent the first few months speaking with a ton of founders understanding hey beyond the funding needs of a company which i mean we can get into detail on what captures does later 
um, we wanted to understand besides the funding, what other pains around cash management and revenue management were they facing? We discovered a million pains. We decided to focus on financing. So helping companies, helping most of all, create all revenue companies to offer flexible payment terms to customers. So paying monthly payments, quarterly payments, but giving them all the cash up front so they would have all that cash to reinvest in growth instead of waiting for it to come in. And then we raised a round over the summer from, you know, uh, some of the best seed investors. So Max Leftsin, co-founder of PayPal and co-founder of Affirm, um, then Blink Capital, Caffeinated Capital. So first investors in Palantir, Lyft, um, Airtable, Docker, and so on. And yeah, went left at the end of August. And since then, it's been crazy, like crazy okay. growth. But, but before we talk about the crazy growth and the crazy stuff, why don't we talk about yeah. the crazy conversation that you had with your parents when you told them that you were dropping out from Harvard Business School? I mean, you know, coming from Madrid all the way to Boston, doing the masters. I mean, that's like a like a big, big break, like a big, you know, thing, you know, especially when you're coming from all the way from Spain. And then, you know, after accomplishing all of that, you have to make the phone call and say, hey, eh, eh, mom, dad, I'm, I'm 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 finished here. You know, <laughs> I'm launching a startup. I mean, how how is that conversation like? Yeah, well, that felt very crazy as well, right? So I think I think you nailed it, right? Coming from Madrid, like when, when you see Harvard in the television, the newspaper as a kid, like it's like a dream, right? Like you just want to go there. And that was my dream. I I never thought it would be possible to go to HBS. And then I finally got in and, and I was so happy. I remember the day they called me, my knees were shaking, right? So it was like, to me, it was like my biggest accomplishment so far. So then I came here. It was amazing, like all the doors that it opened and the vision that it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Like you're here and you're thinking, okay, everybody that comes to HGV is going to be amazing. And then you have to be amazing. Like the pressure is on to something great. So um, it was really good for me. I think that this would have been possible without going to HBS. Spoke with a ton of professors. It opened a ton of doors. And then when we launched CapChase over the summer of our first year, I originally thought that I could do both things at the same time. Um, I needed to stay enrolled for one more semester while I um, got my O1 visa. Because if I had dropped out earlier, I would have had to you know, go back to Spain. And during COVID, it was a bit of a mess. So I stayed in a role trying to do both things, but I would just find myself, you know, like not being able to go to class and just like focusing 100% on the company. And it was a really tough decision to drop out or not. But what I was thinking is, what would I rather drop out of, right? HBS and focus on CapChase or drop out of CapChase and focus on HBS. And the opportunity was just so huge in CapChase that I couldn't say no to it. So then I called my mom and said, hey, like, you know what I've been doing these past few months? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I haven't been able to spend time at HBS, so I'm thinking of taking a break, you know, and see, see Capsis through. And, and then eventually like, I could come back in the future or, or who knows, right? So, so yeah. That's um, so, then, so then obviously you here make the decision of uh, dropping out. You have your, your group of co-founders, which uh, actually you knew from, from the business that you used to work at uh, before doing the master's. Uh, and then you guys get together and, and what were the early days like? I mean, obviously... Uh, about you launched this thing in 2020, right before you know the world, you know, uh, was going down the toilet. So, uh, so I mean, how was that for you? I mean, did you did you at any point think, oh man, I think I may have made a mistake, you know, dropping out of Harvard? <laughs> I think that yeah, there are ups and downs, right, in in, in startup life. Um, but yeah, in our case, like it was just a a, a flurry, right, like. It all went down in a blur. We're just going so fast and doing so many things that we're just more focused on what is the most immediate problem that needs to get solved as opposed to, you know, like um, lingering a little bit on, on, on decisions made in the past. But I remember like it was a journey at the beginning, like our biggest pain was how can we open a bank account in the U.S. without being U.S. citizens, right? So the, our biggest problem for the first like few weeks was how do we get an SSM um, in order to open a bank account? And now like we've grown all the way since then. So at the beginning was a lot of, hey, how do we position this to customers? How do we get one initial customer to prove the traction and then raise money? And when we raised money, it was, you know, like just grow as a team very quickly. Yeah. Um, sorry, as, as a person very quickly because the problems just become more complex and so on. And then it's like the, the biggest problem becomes who do I need to get on board 
you know, to, to get us from where we are right now to where we want to be in the following six months. And then that's, it starts to repeat itself all over again. So I guess that now the biggest problem is always team, team, team. So you, you mentioned how to, how to grow as a person very quickly. And, you know, that's interesting because, you know, sometimes founders underestimate the fact that, you know, those hyper growth companies, they grow very quickly and you need to grow at the same pace so that you are not, you know, being outpaced by the business. And obviously you end up being pushed out, you know, of the business by, by your board, right? By your own investors. So mm-hmm. when you're saying how to grow myself quickly, I mean, what does that look like? And what were some of the things that you did in order to grow at the same pace with the business? Yeah, so I think that it's still, it's still a challenge, like a daily challenge, right? especially, you know, as the team grows. Um, at the beginning, it's very easy because you know more than, about the product than anybody. You're actually doing almost everything. We were four co-founders, so we really divided what we needed to do between the four of us, and it was very easy. But then as you start adding people, because like then like you need to do more and more things as a company. So four people are no longer enough. So you need to start adding people you know, to, to solve problems, then suddenly you are not the one solving the problems, but the one providing input to somebody else to solve the problems. And then you need to trust the, those people and you need to onboard them. You need to um, teach them what the product really is, what the impact is, and just place support without being too overbearing. Because otherwise like, things don't scale, right? If you're like micromanaging, everybody thinks don't scale. So it's learning about how to trust people and how to get them to trust you and how to lever your time up with other people. So I think that that gets really complex after a while especially as the number of direct reports grow and so on. And, and, and I found myself, you know, like uh, spending a lot of time thinking, what should I spend my time on actively, like, like right now, as opposed to um, who should I get to do those things, right? So it, I'm still learning about it, you know, and then when you fundraise, then everything becomes fundraising and everything else, you know, becomes like a secondary uh, priority. So how do you keep in touch with the team to make sure that things are still happening while I'm, you know, dedicated to fundraising and so on. So yeah, there's a great article, by the way, that I recommend to anybody uh, listening um, called Give Away Your Legos, which especially speaks about, um, this from, I think, First Run Capital blog, but basically it, it speaks about, yeah, in a growing company, there are a lot of things that you're doing. And then as a company grows, you need to give them up and get somebody else to do them. And you have to be comfortable with that because otherwise the company doesn't grow and you certainly don't grow. Yeah, right, no, so. that's, that's, that's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. So, so Miguel, in this case, for the people that are listening to really get it, what ended up being the business model of CapChase? Yeah, so basically, I think it's better to start with the problem, right? So um, the problem that we're trying to solve is that founders spend a lot of time and a lot of energy fundraising, and fundraising actually is diluted. So imagine the average founder needs to take 30 meetings in order to get a term sheet. Right? And then when they get a term sheet, it usually involves selling 10 to 20% of the company. And if you do this all over again, you know, four or five times as the average company does, by the time of an exit, the average funding team owns 15% of the company. So then imagine spending seven to 10 years of your life working on something and then you just own 15%, right? So there is a better way, which is what we're doing right now, which is, hey, in a company with predictable revenue and recurring revenue, you need external funding to get started because there's no revenue, right? Like you need to get started, you need to hire people, you need to get the ball rolling. But then there comes a time, usually around, you know, early Series A, maybe in some companies, later Series A, um, where your revenue, especially your deferred revenue, so your ARR, starts to become significant enough. And it becomes a very big cost of opportunity to not use that ARR to grow the business. So that's where CapTis comes in. And what we do is we work with growing companies and we say, hey, you have $10 million in ARR or $1 million, whatever. So instead of waiting for 12 months to get that money through the door, you can come to CapChase and then you can bring to the present those payments, you know, 10, 11, 12 months from now. So you use those payments. Now you can reinvest them in growth or you can cut your burn and extend your runway. And then every month, these companies are growing 5, 10% month of the month. So every month they can keep bringing forward more and more of those future revenues and turn into growth flywheels without getting diluted. Very cool. So, so yeah, if you want to put some numbers, let's say instead of a, a company, let's say $5 million in recurring revenue, um, instead of raising a round of $20 million, you know, um, they could be raising, so $20 million that would last them for two years, so $10 million per year, they could be raising a round of $10 million that will last them for two years, you know, 
and then let's say $5 million is spent each year, and then using those future revenues to keep growing and growing even faster than if they had raised around double the size with double the dilution. And then how are you guys thinking about also M&A? I know that on the M&A side, you guys are also doing some stuff. So, so why don't you tell us about what is the business model? How does that work for M&A? Yeah, super relevant for the show, of course. So um, for M&A, right? So we're seeing a ton of companies in the space doing roll-ups of competitors, you know, the smaller competitors. And, and usually it's like doing an acquisition always um, is tough to find ways to finance it. And I mean, you can find money, but like you need to optimize the cost of financing, right? So buying them with equity money is always a dilemma um, because you can get very, very expensive, right? So you buy a company, I mean, let's take a step back. The average SaaS company is sold for one multiple of their ARR. Why? Because like you get all the headlights on the, all, all the, yeah, all the, all the champagne and so on. And the companies are growing 300% year over year and they trade at 40 multiples of the ARR. But the ones that grow relatively flat, they, they only sold for one um, or two or three multiples of the ARR, right? So what we're doing is we're allowing founders, either search funders or, um, you know, um, PE funds doing roll-ups or even like SaaS companies acquiring competitors and buying uh, companies in the space. We allow them to buy target companies using those target companies' own future revenues. So imagine buying a company, of, let's say 5 million ARR again, to make things easy, 5 million ARR at one multiple of their, of the revenue. Um, you know, uh, you could leverage all of that up with cap chase. So then you, you just, um, buy a company with their own revenues and then pay back over the following couple of years. So you need to spend zero equity acquiring the company. Got it. Very cool. So then, so then in this case, uh, Miguel, uh, how much capital have you guys raised today? We've raised over $90 million in, in both debt and equity. Okay, fantastic. Very cool. And then in terms of, um, of the size of the business right now, because uh, obviously you guys have been growing like crazy, how many employees do you have? And you know, any, any other like, details that you can share in terms of like, perhaps the scope of the operation for people to get an idea of how big CapChase is today? Yeah, so we worked with thousands of companies so far. Um, and it's... it's it's great, right? Like we're growing, you know, over a hundred percent month of the month. It's just exploding uh, because it really is like game changing for founders. And um, one thing that we see that's really, uh, well, that defines why, why this is game changing is we see companies, you know, growing five, 10% month of the month, which is amazing, right? It's like growing, you know, between a hundred to 150% year over year. They come to cap stage, they start pulling those future revenues to the present, and then they start growing 15, 20% week over week. Right, so they focus just on growth and all the time spend on managing cash and understanding what cash is going to look like in the future. All that is taken care of by CapChase automatically. So they just focus on growth. They keep adding ARR and then they bring that ARR to the present to invest in more growth. And they repeat the cycle and it just accelerates and accelerates and accelerates. And we've seen incredible growth stories. Um, yeah, so, so this is just the beginning, right? Like we think that the world is never going back to a world before where you keep funding every company with dilutive financing. Yeah. And yeah, moving forward, people use VC to start with and then other types of financing like captives or okay. alternatives. And then in terms of, um, I mean, obviously you guys, you know, have been, you know, you launched this thing back in 2020 uh, and you've been raising money and you've been also hiring people. But one thing that is very interesting here is that you haven't really met most of the people in person. I mean, can you can you explain to us like how the hell do you grow a company like in? I, I guess this is like the new reality, the new normal that we're or the new world that we're living in, where you just go on a hiring spree and you don't meet anyone in person. So tell us how the hell do you manage to do that? Okay, yeah, uh, <laughs> meeting people in person, funny. So imagine like raising the company or, or building the company in 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 March last year, right? So in the middle of the pandemic, all the countries shutting down and then like you can't really leave the house. So on the one hand, you get a ton of time to think and to work and, and suddenly like you get a lot of time back in the day to, to work on this. But then moving forward, like we launched the company and we had two partners and two co-founders in Madrid and two co-founders in Cambridge. Uh, so of course, I was like the, the point in common with all of them. I worked with the two in Madrid in the same company and then I was going to HVS with the 
with Shamek, with the one in, in, in Boston, but they never met in person until December. So until six months after, after launching. And then like, you know, like let's say a year ago or a year and a half ago, if people have told you that it's possible to build that relationship over the internet, like on, on, on Zoom calls and so on, I would never have agreed. But it's funny because um, we built a business when we got to December, there were around 20 people on the team. We hadn't met, I hadn't met anybody in person beyond the founders. And when we did an offsite, um, we did like a hackathon in December, it was just as if I had been working with those people forever, right? And we had just built a relationship online. So I guess it's the new way of doing things. It gets weird a little bit. And some of the things that happen in the office don't happen online. All the serendipity encounters, you know, and all the like conversations, like banal conversations in the kitchen and so on. And those are parts that I certainly miss. But there are other things that are very, very effective, you know, like asynchronous working and more documentation that helps you know, to attract more ideas and so on. And then uh, in terms of, you know, the business, I mean, you have analyzed, you know, the CapChase has analyzed many, many companies. I mean, what are some mm -hmm. of the typical patterns that, that you've been able to recognize and, and interesting insights from analyzing so many companies? Very good question. So this may be a little bit controversial, but um, let's see. When we look at companies, there are some companies that are like VC darlings, right? They raise a ton of money and they're super sexy and so on. And when you dig into the actual metrics and you are able to forecast them to the future, you see that the metrics are not going to hold up, right? They are absolutely dependent on VC money funding them forward, right? And if you look at Silicon Valley, it's easy to go from A to B to C to D to E, just raising the valuation. And everybody's happy and everybody gets to mark out the portfolios. But then when, it's, when the push comes to shove, you know, like the metrics don't hold up. So we've seen that in a couple of cases and we have decided not to take the risk of funding companies that would depend fully on on, on, on external funding to, to grow. I know that everybody tells a story like, oh no, at scale, the LTV becomes incredible. So the CAC to LTV um, ratio uh, gets super favorable, but usually that's not the case. So um, I guess that's, the single indicator of what makes a great company uh, that we can correlate over the thousands of companies that we've analyzed is um, their LTV to CAC ratio, right? Like above two is okay. Above three is good, pretty good. And then, yeah, you can see cases, you know, like modest growth, but LTVs of north of five, 10 and so on. And you're like, these companies, they just gonna stay around forever. And if you, you know that if you give them $10 million, they will find a way to turn those $10 million into a hundred in growth yeah. and others where they look amazing backed by the best investors and so on. But then you see that the metrics don't hold up and they come, there comes a time where they're fully dependent on external funding to grow. And that funding always stops at some point, right? Got it. And for the people that are listening and watching LTV stands for lifetime value and CAC customer acquisition cost. So, um, so great. So then, so then let me ask you this, Miguel. So imagine that, uh, you're going to sleep tonight and uh, you have the snooze of a lifetime. You wake up in a world five years later and you wake up in a world where uh, the vision of CapChase is fully realized. What does that world look like? Yeah, that world looks like, you know, any founder that wants to launch a business has an idea and they, they just plug into CapChase and then they can just focus on building a product and shipping the product. And everything else that's super annoying, you know, like all the financial operations, revenue operations, all that stuff happens automatically through CapChase by connecting third-party apps that are specialists at what they do. So, and why we're we doing this, right? If you think about a company and what makes a great company, you, you have areas in the company that create value and differentiation and parts that maintain value, right? So by maintain, I mean that if you do them really well, the best possible outcome is that nothing happens. So what creates value in a, in a tech company? It's the product that you build and how you distribute that product. And that's where huge companies are made. If you don't nail that, probably you're not gonna make a great company. If you do them, if you do it really, really well, then you may create a, a great company. But then you have the areas that maintain value. That means that, and specifically let's focus on everything like finance related. So 
how you track cash, how you track revenue, how you invoice customers, how you rec reconcile payments coming in with customers and so on. That part, if you do it extremely well, nobody cares and nothing happens. It certainly is not going to make the company great. But if you don't do it really well, it can kill a great company. Right? So best possible outcome, nothing happens. The potential downside is that it can kill the company. If you like cash falls through the gaps, revenue doesn't get recognized, or worse, it gets recognized, but it's not there. So what we're seeing is that these problems, like the way you track cash, the way you portray revenue to the outside world to get funding and so on, there's a lot of room for errors, takes a lot of space, a lot of um, mind space, a lot of focus, and usually teams trying to uh, work with the similar data sets that get duplicated and so on. And it's a huge pain. So ideally, you know, we have the data to automate all of that and make it run in the background smoothly without pain. So I think that's uh, five years from now, that's what we want, right? Founders just focusing on building and shipping and everything else happens automatically with no room for errors. Very nice. All on autopilot. I love it. Good stuff. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> yeah. so Miguel, so imagine that you have the opportunity of having a chat with your younger self. Let's say I'm putting you into this time machine and you're going back to that time where you were still in consulting, maybe like thinking about launching a business uh, and, and basically you have the opportunity to go now back in time and have a chat with your younger self and give your younger self one piece of advice before launching a company. What would that be and why, given what you know now? Wow, yeah, good question. I think that, I think that I, would, I would tell myself to spend a lot of time thinking about the people that you want to make part of the team very early on, right? So the funding team, of course, is important. I think that we have the, the best funding team possible. But I wish we had spent more time thinking at the very beginning, like what are the key positions that we want and where can we find those people ahead of time? And a great example of who did this extremely well is the Collison Brothers at Stripe, where they spent the first few months just making sure they got the best person for partnerships, the best person that knew banking infrastructure, the best person that knew everything. And then when they launched, it was pretty much a home run from the beginning because they had all that amazing team in place. So. In our case, we have an amazing team. We have the best team in the space for sure. Um, but we've always been like hiring a little bit in our rears, like running ahead and then, oh, we need this profile. Oh, we need this profile. Where do we find them? And how do we get them on board? And I wish we had mapped out better, more thoroughly at the beginning. Like this profile is going to be extremely important. Let's get five shortest candidates for this now before we even need it. Same for everything. And I guess that is the most single the, the most important single piece of advice I would give myself, like, hey, think about who you want on board way ahead of when you need them. I love it. I mean, when you actually have to start making the calls, you know, that could be, you know, too late, you know, when you need that person. So it's important to to build a network before you actually need that individual. So I, I love that piece of advice, Miguel. So I guess for the people that are listening and watching, what is the best way for them to reach out and say hi? Yeah, I'd love to hear, you know, any... Any founders that are thinking of launching fintech, or any founders that that want um, to keep more of the company, so yeah, just feel free to reach out at miguel dot uh, miguel at capchase dot com. So m i g u e l at capchase dot com, and uh, yeah, I'd love to to help in any way that in any way possible. Amazing. Well, Miguel, thank you so much for being on the Deal Maker Show today. It's great. Thank you so much. I had so much fun.